Yo, what's up guys? This is Characters. Um, hello again. We are currently at quite a late stage in the series where we're going over part 3 under application of concepts and today I've got some exciting stuff in store for you guys. Um, I've coined this new concept which I'm going to call TON, T-O-N, I think that's the American spelling of the word. We spell it in a really weird way. Usually I'm all for a British spelling, it's like a lot nicer and stuff, but when it comes to this word, I'm going to have to hand it to the Americans. It's it's not bad. So, yeah, we're on to the under application, and yeah, I did call this not before, which is just insanely um, pessimistic and also doesn't really put the concepts in the right order because I think you can actually do them in the order of ton, which I'm going to do explain more about today. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about imagination next time which is going to be little ways in which people just never make a play that's really, really awesome because they don't really think outside the box. That's definitely something that's underapplied. And then I don't really know where I'm going to go from there. I'm going to think about some later pitfalls that people fall into when they've got all this other stuff down and they've made it as far as maybe 50 NL, 100 NL into the small stakes, the upper end of the Grander School um, scope. <clears throat> so um, today, yeah, we're going to go over a ton. So first of all, T stands for tag, which is nothing to do with a tight, aggressive player, but rather it means tag in the sense of the label which you can give your opponent to sort of <clears throat> decide which kind of player he is or to brand him as a certain type of player for your reference in the future. Um, it's something that's really important, it's something that's quite cool these days because poker sites like Full Tilt and Stars have got like really vast options of colours that you can use and if you're like an OCD um, colour addict like I am, that sounds kind of weird but I love to like assign colours to things, it's like one of my secret like geeky OCD tendencies. Some people are like obsessed about things being neat and tidy, I'm not, I just want something to have a colour that like fits, fits it in my head so that's like my one OCD tendency perhaps. Um, but yeah you can, what I'm going to try and do is talk about how you can actually have a very wide spectrum of different types of players. You don't just, some players have tagging systems as simple as net fish reg, which is just way, way too simple. And there are a bunch of, I think, different paradigms of poker players um, <clears throat> that are really distinctive, equally distinctive, but also quite diverse and numerous. So I'm going to go over that today and label them as such. Um, then I want to talk about how it's actually possible to tag people on very little evidence. One common pitfall in the poker community is people wait far too long to do anything. They sort of sit around and say, oh, I don't have enough info to know anything yet. It's only been six hands. When, in fact, you've probably heard me bang on about this loads in the past. But yeah, you have a shitload of info when you get familiar with different patterns that different player types exhibit. You can almost, in some cases, you can identify them from the, the very first hand they sit down. Being able to do that is has a lot of bonuses that we're going to get into. For one, it can allow you to sort of um, table select better in the lobby even if that player leaves the next hand and you don't get to fully see what he's about you've still probably tagged him correctly and secondly um, it just gives you a better sort of understanding of what of what's going on when you learn to tag players like this you sort of can put them into boxes for sort of general decision making and obviously there are subtypes of subtypes of players but when you've got those general boxes down in your head and you practice this a lot it kind of helps you to have an easier time working out how to play initially against those player types. Like I talked about in that series, adjusting to player types ages ago. Before we have specific information, we want to have good general plans against different player types. So tagging helps you familiarize yourself with them and gives you an active discourse in which to practice the separation of different player types. So it's pretty cool. Um, o stands for observe. So the, I think you can tag before you've even observed anything specific. Like, yeah, of course, you need to make like a very general observation to tag someone. But I've put tag first because I think you can do it with very little info at all. Like, hardly any hands on your opponent. You can still tag them a lot of the time, as I'll talk about later. Observation is just something that you should be doing, like, from the start. You should always be looking for specific things that your opponents are doing, even if you're not involved in the hand. Um, I'm going to talk about using downtime in this video and how you should be always trying to pay attention and never lose track of like a showdown or something, make sure you know what happened in it, get a good idea of what's actually going on around you and using your downtime effectively. Last time we did a, our section on table selection, another underapplied pitfall, um, it's something you should be dedicating a fair whack of your downtime, your downtime to, but you should be splitting up your downtime between table selection and 
um, observation, sort of passive observation of your opponents and note taking and that kind of thing. Um, common inference examples, we're going to talk about how just because you've observed that villain doesn't see bet on queen 7 3 rainbow doesn't mean that that's the only situation you've gleaned information about. You've probably gleaned information that he doesn't see bet some wetter textures than that either. And I'm going to talk a bit about how you can infer from your observations to actually branch out and learn more about an opponent and make some very good and often accurate assumptions about your opponent, um, even in a spot that's totally different from the one in which you observe the tendency in. So sort of taking what you've observed and then applying it into a different situation altogether is something that's a really important skill, something people just don't ever do enough. Like you need to take the note in the first place, you need to know what's going on, you need to then figure out how to apply that into all different spots. It's not easy, it's not something that comes naturally, but it's something that can increase your win rate massively. Then I'm going to play a little game about note quality and get you guys to assess the quality of some made up notes that I've created on made up opponents. Um, and then we're going to talk about which are good, which aren't good, which are the best ones, and then sort of pluck out the factors from that and find which, what goes into a good note, what you should be thinking about when you're taking notes, and what goes into a shit note, basically, because sometimes people just take the most ridiculous notes in spots that don't matter at all, and then are just ignoring spots or a wealth of information that's going to help them a lot in the future. So these are three little things that I've combined into one big video to hopefully give you tons of small ways to improve your win rate and don't underapply these things. So. Let's get into the video. It should be pretty good. I'm definitely looking forward to this one because it's it's another one of these sort of simple ways that you can just boost your win rate massively just by making a few small changes and doing things that don't necessarily require you to be a poker genius. Most of us are not poker geniuses as much as we'd like to be. We need to work very hard for our results, just as most of us in life need to work very hard for our results. So these are some little things that we can do if we're not natural born um, ballers that are just going to crush everything, which we're presumably not unfortunately. So, first of all, tagging a diverse universe. I like the, the ring of that diverse universe, sounds kind of cool. Um, these are the tags that I use. I'm not saying that you need to use these exact same tags, I'm just using this slide to give you an example of the diversity of my tagging system and how there are a multitude of options, basically, that you can use to separate player types. And you'll see here that we have some subtypes, some types like reg, knit, uh, fish, and then we have some subtypes here like good reg, bad reg, very bad reg, agro fish, tag knit, knit, and sort of like breaking them apart into into smaller groupings, which I think is very important to do because there's a big difference between a lot of these subgroups here, even if they are all types of regs. So why don't I go through? You'll see, you'll notice that the colors, me being a bit OCD with the colors. There's a sort of logic to them. The more yellow something is, the more reggae it is in my head. The more green something is, the nittier it is. The more blue it is, the more passive it is. And the more red or purple it is, the more sort of aggro and all over the place it is. That's just kind of the way my mind works with these colours. You might find a way that works for you. It doesn't really matter. All that matters is that there's a logic to it and your brain understands by looking at the colour what kind of player that is. And it's quite automatic and you don't need to keep thinking about it or reminding yourself. So... Whatever makes sense in your head, intuitively go for that. So I've talked about why I've written here what it is that makes me want to tag a player as such, as one of these labels. So let me go through them with you. Um, first of all, a reg who I just tag as like plain yellow is a typical unknown or average regular. Um, it could be someone I know very little about because they've just sat down, but I can tell that they're a reg because they're multi-tabling or because they recognize me from a forum or something like that, I don't know, it could be anything. Um, but I know they're a reg for whatever reason, they're just using sizing. We'll talk about how to identify these players in the next slide, um, but there's a lot of reasons that just give away that someone's a reg right away. It could also be a reg that I know loads about, and I know is definitely a reg for playing with him for months or whatever, and I've got a list of about 50 notes on him. But yet he's still just a reg. I've not changed his tag because he's not good enough to be a good reg and he's not bad enough to be a bad reg. He's typical for the stakes. And remember, just like we talked about last time with the minimum um, standard for table selection, that's relative to the stake that you're playing. And your player tagging system is also should also be relative. I mean, you might get a good reg for 10 NL who's actually really bad for 200 NL. That's obviously just the way it works. Um, the more you move up in stakes, the better the players are on average, so make sure your tagging system applies to your games in general, um, not just 
overall because that's not the way to do it. So this yellow reg is just someone who's a standard regular who isn't out of line in any way, isn't too crazy, um, but isn't like really tight either. It's probably playing something like could be anywhere between like nineteen seventeen and it could be a lag up to like thirty two twenty seven. I don't tag players by whether they're a tag or a lag because I don't have a preference for whether I play against tags or, or lags, as long as the tag is like not super netty, in which case I'd rather play against the net, obviously. I'll get to that in a minute. But I don't tag a distinction between tags and lags just because I think that a lot of lags are quite bad at the stakes that I play, um, and therefore I'm not really bothered about avoiding them or anything like that. I think a lot of the tags are better than a lot of the lags are, so I'm not going to like run and hide from lags. People say they're the worst players. If they're good and dangerous, they can be, but they can also have a hell of a lot of leaks, and it's easier to be spewing everywhere when you've opened your game up a hell of a lot more, so look out for that. So I, I tend to tag regs by how, how much I would like to play against them, not by the type of reg that they are. Okay, so a good reg is orange, which is my favourite colour in the world and a colour that represents good things to me, which is why I tag the reg such. Um, this is someone, a player from whom I've observed evidence of skill. It doesn't need to be someone who's like amazing or has done something like seriously impressive. Oftentimes, if they've done something seriously impressive, I don't even notice, I don't understand why it's good or something like that. There are going to be better players than you in your game all the time. That's just the way it goes. So, a good reg is someone who has, I think, has understood a spot well enough to take a line that's impressed me, to take a line that I've thought, wow, that's actually quite interesting, that's actually really good. Or when I've been reviewing hands in my database, I've seen them just play really solidly and just... I agree with all the plays he's made in certain spots and have identified with an element of skill, him being a thinking player, and furthermore, him thinking in a very good, co coherent, logical way um, and doing things that are impressive. So that's a good reg. A bad reg is someone who's shown the opposite. They've shown me evidence of a lack of understanding in a spot that, you know, shouldn't typically be too complicated. So obviously this is, again, something that should be relative to your stakes if you're playing 5NL. Um, you can't really fault a regular or call them a bad reg because they failed to understand like a really complex situation where ranges were really complicated and stuff. But if you're playing like um, 100 NL and then you see someone sort of not understand how to have a solid 3-bet strategy, then you can probably tag them as a bad reg. Like you see them like 3-bet hand is just like so weak, it just doesn't make any sense in their strategy. And there's no like exploitative reason to think that in that spot, game flow wise, it's like a great thing to do then it probably shows a lack of understanding of how they're playing their range and you can probably tag them as a bad rec. <clears throat> That's one example. So someone who shows a lack of understanding for a situation that is not like out with the competence that you would have at that at that level. So at 50 NL it could it'll be less than it will be at 100 NL. Expectations will be less. But they've shown a lack of understanding which for the level is quite striking and sets them below the average pool of recs basically. And look out for that because once you've tagged someone as a bad reg, you want to go after them lots more. I think my tag for bad reg is less yellow than that. It's more peachy in actual poker stars terms. But, you know, that's obviously too similar. Those two yellows there, but you get the drift. It's not a biggie. Um, just make your own system. So it's important to find bad regs and tag them because you can then rather sit with them, have position on them. You'll know how to exploit them, have a, a list of notes, how you're going to do that, and it should be... It should be definitely very beneficial. So a very bad reg is a, on a similar vein. It's not going to be a fish. It's going to be a player with reggy stats, who regulates, who plays lots of tables, etc., etc. <clears throat> but it's going to be a player who has shown a terrible or very illogical thought process in a spot that's not too complex for the level. So this is going to be someone who's done something similar to the bad reg, but something more drastic for the stake. So for 100 NL, maybe he's just done something that shows like a complete lack of understanding of how to um, assess a situation or whatever. It just shows like a real, a real gap in reasoning that's just way less. That's indicative of a skill level that's way less than should be the norm for the stakes you're playing. So very bad regs can be as good to play against as sort of standard fish sometimes. Um, they're probably on a par with like the, the passive fish or the aggro fish down there, depending on how bad the reg is. Um, <clears throat> I don't tend to tag bad regs as whales because they're just typically they don't have as many of the fundamental flaws as a whale has. I'll get to that in a minute, but I do tag a bad reg um, as such <clears throat> because they can be as 
as good as playing against a fish sometimes and stuff like that so i definitely recommend having this grading system for the regs in your game don't just treat them all as regs per se but tag them out avoid the good ones try and avoid the standard ones play against the bad ones and definitely play against the very bad ones <clears throat> so a tag net this takes me to the next type of player so this is like a reg as well but going in the other direction this time we're going towards the sort of nitty side of things a tag net is someone who's going to be running like 18 16 something like that generally folds blinds very often might three bit bluff sometimes but doesn't doesn't want to play lots out of position doesn't want to defend very often just kind of wants to fold a lot wants to play a wide range on the button yes he'll be positionally aware he's not a total net but he'll be very tight in the first couple of seats very tight from the blinds Folding his small blind a lot more than he should. Folding his big blind way more than he should. You can probably min-raise against this guy a lot. Just play straightforwardly. Look to 4-bet bluff him a lot. Many 3-bets, you don't expect him not to have a 5-bet jam range or anything like that. Um, pretty standard guy. <clears throat> I can think of a few like really good paradigm examples from my regular game. Or what it was a few months ago when I last played it. Um, we'll see if they're still there, these tag nets. But I used to like sort of hunting them down and just sort of sitting to their left and not really worrying about it. Especially... At a time of day when the games weren't very good, like generally, a tag net wouldn't be like my first choice of opponent. It's fine. It's someone you can probably print a little bit against, but not like lots. They're kind of solid, but they do have gaps in it. They just fall too much, and you can just take advantage of that. But when times were bad, and it was like a random Thursday afternoon, and there were just like regs and good regs everywhere with a few bad regs and a few fish, but not very many, then the tag nets were kind of like some of the weaker players about and some of the ones I wanted to to sit with the most so definitely recommend tagging these guys they're very different from a normal reg because they just lack the same capacity of aggression and they just let you have your way far more often which is nice like I talked about last time it can be nice to play with a bunch of nits because you don't even need to think about it it's kind of like giving you more downtime making your life easier your decisions are easier therefore you can play a higher standard of poker across all your other tables at the same time um, <clears throat> so tag nets are definitely people you should try and try and play with when you don't have better options. They're definitely like in the middle of the pack, but towards the sort of positive side of things for me. Then you have a net who's someone you definitely want to play with. Um, a player running something clearly hopelessly nitty, like 15, 13 or less. I don't know. It's hard to put an arbitrary sort of measure on it. You could get a guy that's like 18, 16, but it's just really, really nitty and just straightforward and face up all the time. And I would still tag them as a net. They're definitely a player you want to be playing against a lot. Then we have meh passives, which are like that's my newest tag. The meh passive. It's one I made. I made up like fairly recently in the scheme of things. Um, that's a player who's not loose enough to be like <clears throat> an absolute fish, to be like the fishiest of the fish. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got a bit of a dry slash um, itchy throat right now with hay fever. So. If I'm a little bit croaky or whatnot, I think that's why. So I'm going to be guzzling some water through this video. Um, <clears throat> the meh passive has this big gap that shows that he's not a regular. He's not very aware that he should be aggressive pre-flop and be raising a bunch and stealing blinds. But he's not like crazy. He doesn't want to see a flop with any two cards. He's a bit more patient, but he's just limping all his pocket pairs, limping all his suited connectors, <clears throat> maybe even limping some broadways and suited aces raising only like quite premium hands this kind of guy i'd rather play against this guy than i would the tag net or even like a bad reg <clears throat> that's probably where i'd fit that in <clears throat> so then we've got the passive fish a good old passive fish like very common type of player mass limper um, station could be fit or fold. I don't know why I always write for or fold when I write that term. It's like some block in my head. Not quite sure what that's about. Um, but fit or fold. Generally passive. Um, Forty-five nine. It's like a standard middle of the the park example. But passive fish is just someone who's going to be limp calling a lot. Probably folding to see bets when he doesn't have anything but calling down relentlessly with like a gutter and stuff like that. You get different kinds of passive fish. It's one category that I might even consider branching off into two other kinds like once you know a bit more about them maybe make one purple one like more navy blue just to be really obsessive about it tell you guys exactly how i do it but yeah passive fish is like you could get one who's very very stationary and just doesn't ever fold or you could get one who's extremely fit or fold but wants to see lots of flops personally i really like the fit or fold one like the stationary one's great obviously when you're picking up cards and stuff but if you're card dead you'd much rather be against the the fit or fold fish but either way 
passive fish are definitely like the sort of the holy grail, like the thing you should be going for. They're the most common type of fish by far. They're more common than the aggro fish or the whale. Um, and they're kind of fish that just gives you a very solid win rate. Just play against these guys all the time. Find them when you table select. Make use of them. They're your bread and butter money, basically. If it weren't for passive fish, regs would have a very hard time beating the games because they just have lost like such a huge proportion of the weak part of their field in their games. Um, aggro fish are obviously going to have a bit less of a gap between the VPEP and PFR. Don't get me wrong, they might still have a big gap. They don't need to be playing like 64, 62, which would just be absurd. You don't often see that. Usually they do still limp a bunch, they call a lot, they defend their blinds a lot. They're not usually like really 3 betty or anything, although they can be, but they're typically going to be quite just aggro. They're raising more hands pre-flop. They're usually not super positionally aware, and aggro fish will just raise like random things from under the gun and stuff like that. And the button rate range might be a bit wider, but it's not going to be a big deal. It's going to be like out of proportion, basically, as to what it usually should be, with you know, opening wider on the button and less so in the earlier spots. Aggro fish are awesome players to play against. Um, they can be annoying if you're card dead and they're to your left if they have position on you. It's definitely best. Like I said last time, if you find an aggro fish, you generally want to be on his left. Have the aggro fish on your right so that you can take advantage of all the terrible stuff that he's doing and you can sort of choose when you get involved and see what he does first and just save yourself a bunch of money in like random pre-flop opens and c-bets and stuff like that and you can iso him and have position post-flop that makes such a big difference against an aggro player is that you have position because they can make life really annoying if you're card dead and out of position as you guys are probably well aware of and have probably been a bit tilted by in the past I know I have um, then you get the whale who is like the absolute best thing that you can find like way way better than any of the other player types conceivably better than lots of the player types put together it's just great um, a whale is a horrendous player um, in some obvious ways seek and destroy basically so this is someone who's just doing something that's so obviously awful that you should just have no problem at all like beating the hell out of them like for example a whale will play like 94 9 or something like ridiculous I'll just be like seeing a plot with any two cards and just like stacking off with a pair or like stacking off with a gutter or just calling down with third pair in massive pots calling three bets pre-flop with any two cards and continuing with ace high or bear to the river these kind of things it could be any kind of manifestation of just ridiculous awful play basically when you have a whale or someone who's close to being a whale definitely tag them differently because there's a huge difference table selection wise between wanting to play against an aggro or passive fish and wanting to play against a whale basically the whale is just like a million times better if someone is this outlandishly awful like you just need to track them down you need to do everything you can to play against them other people might just tag them as a fish I give them the whale tag and I like the first thing I write in the note box as you've probably seen is like whale and block caps just to like remind myself how much I need to play against this player in the future should I ever see him it's worth getting on waiting lists for it's worth following him about if he moves up to like four times the stakes you normally play maybe you should take a shot at him that's how bad this guy is depending on your mentality and your bankroll management but yeah this is the kind of guy you follow up that i follow up to like 400 nl when he goes tilted and I, I get a bit freaked out playing 400 nl but at the same time i know it's so so plus ev with this whale that even if i run bad and lose a bunch to some regs then it was the right thing to do so the whale is the kind of guy you chase up the stakes he's that bad he gives you an incentive to play out with your bankroll, that's how fucking bad he is. So yeah, whales, definitely, can't stress that enough, separate them from other fish, because you do get guys that are just endlessly bad at poker. Okay, evidence. What do you need to know to be able to tag someone? Not as much as you think. For example, you need very little to stick up a provisional tag that helps you table select or play readless in the future. This tag is subject to change. It's not like you've tagged someone and then you can never go back and alter it. Of course you can. But the provisional tag is really cool because it might be the case you don't play very many hands at the table. The guy leaves, he gets busted, whatever. Then you see him two weeks later and you know what kind of player he is. So definitely tag on very little information whenever you can. And here are some ways in which you can go about doing that. Firstly, if villains ever non full stacked and isn't a short stack regular that's to say he's not playing off like a 40 20 or 50 big blind stake in a regular topping up kind of fashion 
then he's almost certainly a fish. You don't really get regs these days that like intentionally load up to only 94 bucks or something like that. And generally fish don't load up. You'll just see them have a random arbitrary stack size that dwindles a bit, goes up again. They don't load up. And sometimes it can be like it can catch you off guard because they look like a reg. They're playing like with a hundred and thirty dollar stack at hundred NL, but then they lose fifty bucks, and then the eighty bucks never gets replenished up to a hundred. And then you think, aha, that's not a regular. That's a fucking fish. Sorry, I'm swearing a lot today. I met some Canadians the other night in Barry. Um, it was kind of refreshing to hang out with some people who weren't like English teachers or Italian. Um, it was cool, and they just swear so much. I think it's like being built into my head. So this is a few days later now, on the bank holiday Monday. So if I'm swearing a lot, that's probably why I blame the Canadians. Blame Canada, as they say in South Park, the movie. That takes me back. Anyway, let's get off this ridiculous tangent that's possibly offensive and get back onto poker. So you can spot these guys who don't have a full stack <coughs> very easily, and. It's a good indication that it's a fish. What do I do if I see someone with a non-full stack before I know exactly what kind of player they are? I'll probably tag them as a fish, a passive, a passive fish, and then go from there. Passive fish, like I said, are the most common variety, so I'll just start. I'll just start with that. So here are some examples of <clears throat> how I will tag someone very early on in a session before I know a hell of a lot about them. Before I've got a sample on the HUD or an extensive sample on the HUD that tells me exactly what kind of player they are. Um, and the HUD doesn't even always tell you that, it just gives you like a rough guideline to go off of. There are lots of other better ways in the HUD for player typing people early on in a session. So for example, villain has a non-full stack and isn't a short reg, villain limped. If villain open limped, like okay maybe if he limped behind he could be a reg but he's probably not. And if he open limped, he's just not a reg, that just doesn't ever happen, let's face it. Don't be one of these stupid guys who sits here, sorry for ranting, but this just really annoys me when students say things to me like, well, I've only I've only been at the table for one orbit so I can't tag players yet. It's like, but this guy just limped twice and he has a picture of like <clears throat> Donald Duck in a football strip like kicking a watermelon as his avatar and he's just got a name with like loads of numbers in it and he's shouting like, I hope you die into the chat. Like, come on, man, he's clearly not a regular. <clears throat> so, yeah, villain limped, big indication. If he limps, tag him as a passive fish, do it, go from there. Villain opened 5x in the button, probably a spazzy fish, not really any other player type he could be. Could be a passive fish gonna, that's got excited with his pocket jacks and quote-unquote would rather not see a, flap, a flop because he always loses with jacks or something like that. But a lot of the time it'll be a, it'll be a <clears throat> aggro fish. But sometimes it might just be a passive fish that's got excited. Um, it's hard to say. <clears throat> I'm going to pause the video just for a second because like, I think I need to cough something up. It's a bit disgusting. Okay, so where were we? Um, so, villain posted under the gun. This is just something a regular doesn't do. They know it's not good to post an extra big blind in a terrible position where you're first to act. It's just a bad idea if someone does it. They're probably a fish. Um, villain instantly min raised the flop twice. This is just a weird random example, but it's definitely something that shows you that your opponent's probably fishy. Generally, when regs play back at you on the flop, they make some funky 2.6x raise size or 3x or 3.5x or 4.5x if they're quite bad or whatever. It's hard to say, but if they just instantly click it back like twice, they're probably an aggro fish. Like one of the strategies of the aggro fish is to just click it back against your C bets because they've kind of realized that you're C betting a lot. Like you're always betting the flop and you don't always have the top pair when you do it, so you're just bluffing and they should just like bluff back at you by hitting the raise button. Happens a lot, so that's definitely a common one to look out for for the aggro fish. Um, villain open folded, I mean a reg just won't usually, I mean a reg might do it for like comical value if there's absolutely nothing else to do in a spot, but it's just like against the reg's intuition to ever open fold. And then that box comes up and is like, are you sure you want to fold when you could check? And usually if a reg's misclicked open fold, they're going to hit no and they're going to check instead. Whereas a fish will actually, you know, hit fold and then adamantly hit the yes, I'm sure I want to fold. I hit the fold button, didn't I? What you asked me this for. So yeah, fish, open fold, no one else really does it. By the way, open folding, just to clarify that terminology, if you've not heard that before, if I've worded it confusingly, means 
folding when you have the option to check, when there's not a bet that you're faced with that you have to call. Um, villain is multi-tabling, probably a reg, almost certainly. Fish, I mean, it depends. Sometimes fish are like two or three table. They'll have the awkward stack sizes across all the tables. You'll be able to tell. It'll still be obvious. Hidden from search is a common one. That's kind of like you don't really know if it's a fish or a reg, but I'd lean towards reg because fish generally don't take the time to go out and hide themselves from search. They don't really care. They'd rather just play poker or gamble or whatever. So if they're... If they're multi-tabling, like playing six tables or whatever or more, they're almost certainly a reg, even four tables. Um, if they're one of these crazy players playing like 16 tables, you can probably assume that they're not paying that much attention. They're kind of autopiloting a bit. Um, and you might have more of an edge than you would normally if they were playing less tables. So these are the little things that allow you to just go ahead and tag people right away. Nets take a bit longer, like the difference between a, a normal regular and then like a tag reg, a tag net, and then a full-blown net is often not obvious at first because it's hard to sort of glean much from people folding in the first sort of five hands. So that's one area where you don't have quite as much leeway to go ahead and tag people right away, but you can definitely sort of rule out certain player types like aggro fish, passive fish, whale, um, <clears throat> really aggro reg and stuff like that. Ambulance going past, so I'll just wait a minute. <clears throat> It's a bit of a noisy city. I apologise that the sound quality will not have been as good over these past few months, along with lots of other things that have just suffered while I've been here, so I do intend to make that up to you guys by producing some high quality videos on the old, good old iMac um, and the nice quiet comfort of my flat back in Glasgow, Scotland, so I'm definitely going to make it up to you guys by recording from a good environment again very soon. So, ambulance is gone, let's continue. Um, now we're on to observations, so how to use downtime. Simple little things you can do to increase your win rate by being more vigilant. First of all, avoid obvious distractions. You're on the internet. Um, at a card room, you don't normally have the option to like go and speak to people or, I don't know, read the news or whatever, stuff like that. I mean, some people read newspapers while they're playing poker in Vegas, I guess. Um, there are massages and strange little things you can do there, but generally speaking, you don't have those distractions, but online, you have a hell of a lot of distraction. Facebook, news sites, forums, games, while grinding, just a bad idea. They're unprofessional and they disrupt the flow to playing well, so don't do them. Every showdown is a goldmine of information. Train your brain to notice them and check when you've got time. So if nothing's going on and you see a showdown, first thing you should do if you don't desperately need to like table select or something is switch out, is to take a note to see what happened and work out what happened in the spot. And you can probably learn a lot about a different about a player type in that kind of scenario. Um, often it's showdowns like that, passive showdowns that allow me to tag a reg from being a standard reg to being a bad reg or a very bad reg or a good reg. I can see what line they took, I can see their cards, therefore I can see their full thought process. Um, so I can actually see what they had, and there I can and therefore I can go from there and sort of work out if they're maybe like a bit below the curve for the level or a bit above. Or whether they just do something that's a bit unique or unusual, which is something that's good to take a note. There's a little clue for the game we're going to play later. Um, you want to generally note unusual tendencies. And showdowns during your downtime from other players can definitely give you leads and clues um, to allow you to do that. If you've got nothing going on, assess tables and observe. So assess your tables, look at your minimum standard like we talked about last time, do some table selection, but also observe what's going on. Tag any little subtle things you see, any little sizing quirks, any strange lines, any like putting lots of money into the pot, then folding in a situation that just seems absurd. These things can give you good clues as to how competent someone is and how they play. So do that. Write notes from memory. Um, tag unknowns. These are another two things you can do. So you should be looking to tag a bunch of of players like as soon as you see them, like when you have downtime. See if you can tag them. Are they multi-tabling? Are they obviously looking reggae by opening 2.74x under the gun and then 2.46x in the hijack or whatever these fancy ass new new generation regs with their extremely specific table ninja <clears throat> sizing like to do. Um, but yeah, that's good because when they do that, they're just telling you that they're a reg like right away and you can just tag them as such. Um, are they fishy? Are they limping? Are they doing the things we talked about before? Look to tag them quickly. 
write notes from memory by that I mean like did something happen quite recently but you were like really swamped with action you couldn't take a note on it go back through the history you just played like four really interesting hands all at once you've not digested what happened yet you just won some money you were happy and you moved on but no go back and look how did your opponents play you saw two showdowns what happened take notes um oftentimes you don't have the time to take a note at the, at the time of the hand because there's just too much going on you need to be thinking about too many other things so always look to to take notes afterwards when you finally get that downtime and a hand is maybe still <laughs> fucking got it yes mosquito dead that was the bastard Sorry about all the swearing. I swear it's like the Canadians and stuff last night. Bad influence on me. This mosquito was just like annoying me all night and I just finally killed it. I got bitten like 12 times last night for my troubles, but it feels good to have, to have sought revenge on the mosquito. Um, so anyway, my chat will go back to like boring things like houseflies and wasps when I go back home, but for now it's all about the mosquitoes. So write notes from memory, good thing to do. Don't let all these, all the wealth of information pass you by just because you were too busy at the time. Use your downtime. Every time you've got downtime, get your brain into a habit, into a way of thinking where you sort of decide what's the best way for me to use this downtime and choose between table selection, choose between memory notes, tagging, assessing, just generally observing and watching what's happening around you. Passive observation is like spying because a reg doesn't know that you know something about them. It's very easy to sort of figure out that when you're, you play a big pot against one opponent and you show down a hand that's maybe a bit dubious or strange or you know special or unique in some way, it's very normal to think that they're going to remember that and then you can even take notes such as has seen me do this. These are good kind of notes, these kind of like reflect, reflective notes where it's not about what your opponent did but it's about what he's seen you do so it's about how you're reflected in his eyes. And that's likely to change the way that he perceives you. If you think he's a good, solid player, chances are he's taken a note about it as well. So it's good to sort of have a note in your note box. This is all meta-noting now that says, villain probably has a note that I do this. Because one thing about notes is that they don't always hold true forever. And you can sort of readjust again. And then he's got a note saying that you do something that you no longer do against him. That's pretty cool. So it's good to take these... It's good to take those kind of meta notes, but it's also good to observe villain when you're not in a hand with him. You're just watching him play. Um, he might think that his opponents observe something, but he might not necessarily remember that you've seen him. I mean, there's so many players at all your tables. You're playing eight tables. Why would you remember that all all the random regs that were there that saw you do something? You just wouldn't. So yeah, that's pretty pretty cool to observe passively. It's like spying because you'll have a bunch of notes on your opponent that he doesn't even know that you have. So that's definitely cool. Um, so common inferences. It's like I said at the start of the video, you don't always have to have to use your notes and inferences, your notes and observations completely literally. You can use them to infer things that are likely to be the case about your opponent's game. And in fact, that's the best thing about it. That's the main purpose of taking a note, because it's very rare that the exact same spot will just come up time and time again, but rather general similar situations or situations of the same kind of broad type will come up and you can often use your observations to to predict accurately what villain's going to do in these, you know, not not really similar but fairly type similar spots. So here are some examples as to how I do this. Um, and this is something you should definitely be doing and looking to incorporate into your game if you're not doing it already. Um, first one. Villain checked back Jack 6 2 rainbow heads up as preflop razor. So his C betting range on Queen 10 3 2 tone 3 way is probably very strong. I shouldn't check raises the bluff too much here. This is a really solid inference to make because if Villain doesn't C bet this really dry board, he's probably not going to C bet air on the wet board. He might not even C bet some top pair. He might have a very, very tight C bet range indeed, and that's something you can definitely exploit. Um, secondly, I'm just giving you a few examples here and you can go off and try and do this on your own. Villain 3-bet bluffed with 7-3 offsuit. This one's a bit more complicated. He doesn't need to have much equity for raising this flop c-bet if he's bluffing. So we've seen him 3-bet pre-flop with 7-3 off before, which shows that he doesn't really think about selectability of hands and playing his range and choosing the best of his folding range. He's just randomly choosing a hand in a spot to, to bluff with, which means that post-flop, 
he doesn't necessarily need to have draws or semi-bluffs or whatever to be raising the flop. He can basically just be doing it with any two cards because he feels like bluffing. Therefore, when a flush card comes on the turn, I don't need to be as wary of it. I don't need to think the villain has a flush as often there. Whereas if I'm playing against someone a bit more solid and compact with their game, then I know that they probably select hands specifically that have some equity and are semi-bluffs and things like that when they do have a bluffing range. So I, I am doing way less well. I'm doing much worse on flush card turns and I can look to fold a lot more. Or thirdly, villain missed an easy value in the river. So I shouldn't call turn and fold river here. This is like a bit of more of a jump of an inference. So the idea here is that if villain isn't able to find easy value bets in the river, then his value range on the river is probably really small because it's constricted to to being really, really strong hands. Um, therefore, if he's capable of bluffing, then bluffs are going to constitute a much wider part of his range on the river. Therefore, it doesn't make sense for me if I think his range is like quite weak on the turn or it's weak enough for me to call the turn, it doesn't make sense for me to then fold the river very much because villain is just not value betting that thinly and therefore his value range is going to be small and if I thought he had bluffs on the turn then he probably still has some on the river. So that's a bit of inference. There's three things I've observed and then applied them in different situations. Not totally different situations but in situations that are, you know, a lot not similar anyway. They're certainly like far from similar to the spot that they were first observed in. So inference is important. It's not about taking a note in case that exact spot comes up again. It's about taking a note that you can infer general tendencies from your opponent about your opponent from, basically, and then use them in lots of different spots. Note quality. So here's a little game to finish off. Well, second last slide, then we're going to talk about what makes a good note. Um, so pause the video here. I want you to read these six different notes. Imagine these in inverted commas, quote, quoted. Raise C-bet on dry flop. Four bet bluff first time round, but inverse small blind. Raise C-bet on jack three two. Two tone, meaning two different suits on the flop. And then check fold flush card turn. Seems aggressive. Three bet jams, nine nine. Blind versus blind after seeing me four bet bluff. C-bets, king seven two, button versus big blind. Then bets turn and river with ace king. So six notes. Three of these are really good notes, I would say. Three of them are not so good notes. Um, try and put them in order. What notes are the best? What's the best note here? What's the worst note here? Fill in the gaps, pause the video, make a little list one to six and write in which ones you think are which. It's always good when you're learning to not just be a passive sort of leech observing like, like a sponge, but getting involved and trying this on your own. And you'll, you'll be way more likely to remember it and use it in the future and improve your note taking if you participate in this game. So I definitely urge you to do that. Pause the video now. Okay, so I'm assuming you've unpaused and we are ready to go through the answers. Let's go through them like one at a time here and see what you think. So raise C-bet on dry flop. Is this note good? Is it bad? I don't think it's very good. It doesn't really, I mean, it's okay. It, it does show you that your opponent um, has a raising range there, but you're going to know that anyway next time you see him raise. It doesn't really give you very much info. You didn't see him give up on the next street, you didn't find out that his range was probably weak or strong, you didn't find out that he had a bluff in his range there, you didn't find out that he did it for thin value, you don't really know what he did it with. So this note is kind of just like confusing and is maybe just going to make you more likely to not fold in the future, but that's not necessarily the best thing you should do in this situation. All you know is that he, ra he raises dry flops, he has a raising range, we don't really know what it's composed of or why he's doing it. So this, flop, this note is kind of pointless. Um, I would probably rather just not take a note in this kind of spot at all. I mean, it might not be totally harmful to take a note like this, I just don't think it really gives you anything um, to work with in the future. It doesn't really um, give you anything specific or unique to Villain's game that you can use to your advantage. Um, so this one is definitely below, and at the sort of bottom of the pile, if not the very bottom. Next one, 4-bit bluff first time round, button versus small blind. This is a very useful note. Um, this is something that gives you a good idea as to what kind of opponent your opponent is. He's probably not really tight, he's probably not like super straightforward, he probably likes to get on the front foot early and play some aggressive shots basically. 
if, to put it into kind of like cricket or baseball terms, I guess, weirdly. My flatmate's always using like sports metaphors, so they're kind of infecting my head. Um, so if a guy four-bit bluffs like the first time round, you've just sat at the table, you've never really played with him before, he's probably looking to war. You can probably like have a quite wide three-bit value jam range there right off the bat. Um, you can look to, to not three-bit fold so much, basically. And if he four bets wide, he probably three bets wide as well. It's just something that goes hand in hand. You can make a lot of inferences from that note, so it's definitely a good one to have. Raise C bet on Jack 3 2, two tone and check fold flush card turn. This is an excellent note. Um, basically, because Villain has raised like a two tone board, like, okay, a kind of standard board to attack a C bet on, but then he's not followed through on this flush card, which means that he probably doesn't have. Like equity here, so he's not raised with a backdoor draw, he's not raised with a flush draw, he's prob probably bluff raising without very much equity. That's something you can infer from that. If you need to, you can write, you know, therefore probably doesn't, you can generalize this note, that's a cool thing to do as well. You could say, villain likely bluff raises flops without much equity, but it's always good to know the exact kind of situation villain did it in, so it's, there's an argument for making a more specific note here as well. Um, and you can certainly do both. So, this is definitely a good note. Four seems aggressive. This note's pretty terrible. Like obviously, this is kind of like the red herring, like the obviously bad note. I think you probably all identified it as such. It's the kind of note that just doesn't really help you. You'll know that from the HUD anyway. You'll know that from the player type. Um, yeah, you could say seems aggressive, but why not just wait until you can note something more specific and just tag him as an aggro fish for now or whatever, or an aggro reg, depending on how your tag system works and what kind of player it is. So that's just not a very useful note. Definitely put that towards the bottom of the pile. Um, <clears throat> by the way, I'd say that last one, Ray C button, Jack 3 2, 2 tone, is probably the best note here. Then the 4 bet bluff one I would put in second place. 3 bet jams, 9 9, blind versus blind, after seeing me 4 bet bluff. This is also a very good note, it's very specific. It gives you an idea of how your opponent is likely to adjust, so you can readjust and hopefully win the war of exploitability. Any note that allows you to exploit your opponent very well is going to be a really good one. Um, so this is a top note as well, definitely. Okay, the last one. This note is like might seem okay, but this is actually a really horrible note. It's just okay. I shouldn't say horrible because it's not going to like do you lots of harm. It just doesn't really tell you anything because it's not distinguishing in any way. It's just the typical way that anyone is going to play this hand. Really, <clears throat> it's a very common way for someone to play Ace King in this spot. They bet flop, they bet turn, they go for three streets of value on a dry board. Of course, why not? Um, it's kind of pointless. It's kind of just like being a robot that's just writing down everything you see. You don't have time to take a note on everything, which is why you kind of need to train your brain to take notes on the really important things that are really going to benefit you in the future. So let's order these quickly. I'd say the worst one is <clears throat> probably the last one. <clears throat> Although they're all really, okay, no, the last one's not the worst one. It does give you some idea that your opponent doesn't take a funky line in that spot, at least. Let's say the worst one is raise C-bet on dry flop. I think that's kind of, like, really bad. Seems aggressive, might help you a little bit in the future, but it's still fairly bad. Then C-bet's king 7-2 is a pretty bad note. It doesn't really do much for you. It doesn't distinguish anything. The other three are really good. I'd say, like, the raise C-bet on jack 3-2 one is just really cool because it just gives you so much detail and just shows you exactly what your opponent's doing. 4-bet um, bluff first time round is a really good one, very common one, and 3-bet jams 9-9 nine, nine is very specific and good. So I can't really, like... I'd probably put raise C-bet on jack 3-2 first, and then 3-bet jams 9-9 nine, nine second, and then 4-bet bluff first time third, or something like that. But they're all good. Three good ones, three not-so-good ones. And here's why. Let's summarise why we made those decisions, why we said some were good and some aren't. So... To summarise and to round off the video for today, a good note should do some of these things. It should firstly eliminate a, ten illuminate a tendency that stands out in some way from the conventional or the optimal, basically. So like I said before, I'll tag a bad reg if he does something that just clearly stands out, has a tendency that's just not good for the stake, it's a lack of understanding or whatever, misapprehension of a certain situation. Um, <clears throat> so a good note should illuminate these tendencies. It should make it obvious to you what your opponent's doing wrong or doing differently and how you can react to that and how you can exploit it. You should understand how you can how you can take advantage of it. It should also give hero opportunity to exploit villain in the future. So it's kind of the same thing, but it should lead villain it should lead hero to a clear path of action that they can use to exploit villain.
For example, that last one about the Ace King that you just bet three streets that's standard. It doesn't help you exploit villain. But the thing about the Ray Seba on Jack 3 2 does, you can just start floating flops if villain's likely to give up on even the best turn cards for his perceived range. So, yeah. Because his range is like gonna be a lot flusher as there and stuff. So if he's giving up on even like a random even like the best turn card ever, like a flush card, then he's giving up a hell of a lot of the time and Hero can just look to float a lot with backdoor equity and all that and just take it away from Villain on the turn. So we've got a direct line of attack opportunity to exploit Villain specifically in the future. A good note should also help Hero characterise the type of player Villain is more specifically than Hero's tag system. This seems aggressive thing doesn't really do that. It's bad because it doesn't really hone in on Villain's exact tendencies. A note, however, like um, four bit bluffs the first time round, that does um, that specifies things to a greater level of detail than just tagging someone as a standard wreck or an aggressive wreck or whatever. Um, so it's good. It builds upon Villain's tag system. The tag system is an easy sort of way to table select in the lobby to see what's going on in a broad level and to sort of provide a quick categorization but your note box is there for you to build upon that and add things to it so your notes that follows from that that your notes should actually build upon your tagging system they shouldn't just be like less detailed or of equal detail to the tag system if that's the case you can just use the tag system and it's much more efficient and better and doesn't take up space in your note box that's the other thing your note box is kind of finite but it's Maybe it looks a bit better if you use it on hold the manager, but you don't want to be wading through like loads and loads and loads of notes in real time during a hand. You just don't have time to do that, so you kind of need to not take really terrible notes because they're just using up space for no reason on your hard drive of hard drive of note box, if you like. The last thing they should highlight, or they can highlight, a misunderstanding, a logic failure on Villain's part. That's a really good kind of note, something that shows that villain's just like villain three bet, three bet me with deuce four off suit when I opened under the gun. It's just kind of like wow, you've kind of failed at playing your range there. You don't really understand that you should, you know, play a strategy in that spot. And you should look to three bet hands that make sense and aren't totally hopeless post flop. So these things all make good notes. Um, remember, guys, these are little things you can do. Ton, T O N, T is for tag, O is for observe, N is for note. These are just little things you can do to really improve your win rate and I hope you guys can avoid this pitfall of under applying ton and go out and start doing it a bit more. It doesn't take poker genius um, if you're still a developing player and you're not all that confident in your ability yet. You can probably just accelerate your progress and your win rate by doing these little things as well as improving your decision making process of course as you need to do. So. That's all I've got for you today. Next time I'm going to talk about imagination and how you can sort of take some non-obvious lines in a bunch of spots that can just really boost your win rate as well and how to make sure that you constantly think outside the box and play your A-game as often as possible. I just got massive fright there because I hovered over that and it was like I hadn't resumed it from when I paused and I was just like, oh, fuck my life. Just started to sort of feel a bit sick. But yeah, video recorded. Um, all good. Leave me your questions or comments, and I'll see you on the next one. Thanks a lot.